down to do a funeral on Thursday, or on Friday, excuse me. And you know, the weather was just gorgeous over there. In fact, it just gave me a couple seconds to think, you know, you know, maybe I could live over there. It's like, no, yeah. So anyways, it's good to be back. So uh, no, no problems there. Uh, today, though, uh, we continue our journey through Lent. Uh, we're going to be focusing uh, today uh, on the Gospel lesson of John. And uh, quite interesting interactions going on there. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. It's, it's actually kind of humorous. But I'll, I'll save that for, for, uh, for the sermon. Um, and also, you know, just please remember that we're celebrating the Lord's Supper today. So please spend some time in meditation and thinking about what God gives to us through that gift of his body and blood. Why we so desperately need that. So spend some time meditating. There's uh, the pew folders. Uh, there's some... Pamphlets in the, in the bulletin, or excuse me, in the pews that will actually uh, help us uh, to, to work, work through that. Um, uh, next week, I've got a winkle, so I'll be out of the office uh, for a couple days. Not here, but actually just for a day on, on Tuesday. Um, other than that, I should be back and be ready to go for a while. Uh, other than that, just real quick prayer requests. I want to make sure I got these right. Just, We've got quite a few. The prayers are in the bulletin today. So if you take a look at those uh, on page, I can find it, on page 13. Uh, so we're going to continue to lift up for healing. Uh, Roy, Jim, Jeannie, Stetson, Dave, Tom, Gray, Katie, Miranda, Hazley, Cindy, Rindy, Elida, Haleo, Vicky, Klaus, Ray, and Sandy, and Judy. Is there anybody else we need to look up a prayer at? Yes. What's your last name again, sir? Her last name is Klaus. House? How. How. Okay. Okay, anybody else we need to be prepared for this morning? Okay, great. Well, appreciate everybody here this morning. And I think with that, we're ready to start worship. We'll start with the call to worship. We continue with song.
Christ. We begin the service this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding, that I may keep your law, and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Behold, I long for your precepts, and your righteousness give me life. Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. Let us make confession of our sins to God, our gracious Heavenly Father. Eternal God, we confess that we have sinned and need forgiveness. By nature, we are sinful from the very beginnings of our lives. Through our thoughts, words, and deeds, we continually sin against you. We have lived for ourselves in many ways, breaking your commandments that direct us not to lie, steal, or transgress your holy will. We have walked in darkness of bad choices and have not left fulfilled opportunities to do good and be a blessing to others. O oh God, in your mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness and indifference that we may joyfully follow your will and gladly love your commandments. Graciously forgive our sins and direct us in ways of compassion and love. God promises to hear those who turn to him with repentant hearts. Upon this your confession and in this stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. So go in peace. Amen. My eyes have ever towards the Lord. For he will pluck my feet out of the net. Verses 14 to 21. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills. 
and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools, and I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. Hear you deaf, and look you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf is my messenger whom I send? Who is blind is my dedicated one, or blind is the servant of the Lord? He sees many things, but does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased, for his righteousness' sake, to magnify his law and make it glorious. This is the word of the Lord. Today's epistle reading comes from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 14. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Gospel lesson. So today we have a pretty lengthy gospel, so you may be seated for this one. Today the Holy Gospel comes from to us from St. John, the ninth chapter. So as Jesus <coughs> passed by, so before you get started, this is actually going to be the text that I'm going to be speaking to. So this is what I want you to do. Uh, Really concentrate on what's going on. Who's the actors? How's the dialogue? How's the interaction going with this text? So we begin. So as Jesus passed by, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents? That he was born blind. And Jesus answered, he said, It was not that this man sinned or his parents but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the, the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Saloma, which means sin. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, Is he? Others said, No, but it looks like him. But he kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how are your eyes open? He answered the man called Jesus. He, excuse me, he answered the man called Jesus, made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who was formerly blind and blind. That was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened the man's eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to him, to them, He put mud in my eyes, and I washed, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was division among them. So again, they said again to the man, the blind man, What do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had, opened, he had been 
that he had been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked him, Is this your son? Who do you say who's who you say was born blind? Then how does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews already had already agreed that anyone that if anyone would confess Jesus to be the Christ, he was, be, they would, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I know, I do know is that I was blind and now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. And the man answered, Why? This is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opens open my eyes? We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since you've been, ever since the, the world began, has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind? If this man went off from God, he could do nothing. The answer to him, you were born in utter sin, and you would teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered. And he answered, And who is his? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him, worshipped him. And Jesus said, For judgment I came into the world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near heard him say these things, and they said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I'd ask the children to please come forward for a quick children's message. Jesus, and he went and he did what Jesus told him. 
And why didn't the guy do that? Why didn't the guy just say, you're crazy, Jesus. You're putting mud on my eyes and I'm going to be able to see? No way, Jose. Think he'd say that? No. But he, he, he did. So he believed, right? He believed that what Jesus was going to do to him was going to heal him. Right? And we call that faith. It's a big word, but faith really just means belief. <coughs> and this guy had hope and believed that what Jesus said was true. And even though he wasn't quite sure who Jesus was, he was also maybe just a prophet. He had heard about the miracles, and he knew that Jesus would have the power to be able to cure him. And that's the same thing for us too today. We have to have faith that what God promises, he's going to deliver. Like he promises, we need to have faith that he promises he's going to take care of you. He's going to lead you and guide you. He's going to keep you safe. He's always going to provide good things for you. And because we have faith and we believe in that, what happens? We get it. Now sometimes it might not happen the way that we plan. It might be a little bit tougher. But Jesus always promises one promise that you never should forget. That he promises to take care of you according to his will. And sometimes his will is bigger than what we can actually think and comprehend, right? So Jesus really loves you. You know why he loves you? Because he died on the cross for you. And you know where Jesus lives? Where does Jesus live? And where else? In your heart. Very good, Val. Very good. Yeah, he lives inside us too. So we can have that faith, knowing that he's inside of us, and he'll always take care of us, right? So let's pray to Jesus and thank him for that. Can you pray after me? Congregation, please pray with me. That's also awesome. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving us and giving us faith to trust in your promises. We know you love us, and we love you too. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Because that's the truth, right? All right, well, thanks for coming up. Go back to your seats now. We continue to sing it.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So the title for the message today is The True Light. And we're going to be focusing uh, on this gospel lesson in, uh, uh, for this Sunday. So, you know, have that open and you can kind of kind of follow along because we're going we're gonna to speak. I'm going to try to speak to all of this. But specifically, I like the part of 1 John. I'm going to go back to 1 John. If you remember a few Sundays back, we actually started with 1 John. And it's really interesting because if you look at 1 John, 1 John is really a, a cumulation or a or a snapshot of this whole gospel lesson that John teaches about, really the effectiveness in the life of Christ. And I like specifically verse 9 where John speaks, he says, where Jesus tells his disciples, says, the true light which enlightens everyone has come into the world. Jesus' world. So I don't know about you, but I like a good drama. I really like a good drama. And, you know, there's different kinds of dramas, I mean, uh, but I kind of like a, a comical drama. And if you look at the scripture lesson that we read today, the way John addresses this whole interaction with, with Jesus and this blind man is really quite dramatic. But if you really think about it, the whole interaction between these people is quite hilarious. So let's take a look about this a little bit. So a little bit different spin here this morning. So, but before we start, as you look through this, who are the main characters in this whole interaction as Jesus is in the city and he heals this blind man? Who do we see active here? Who's in this, this, in this whole situation? So, obviously, we see Jesus is there, right? The disciples. Jesus and the disciples. We have a blind man. Interesting enough, John doesn't say his name, does he? No. All we know is this guy's blind. He's been blind from birth. So we have the blind man. We have his family, his mother and father, and then all the friends, and then obviously the Pharisees. So that's all the people that are actually involved in this whole story where John speaks about this miracle that Jesus performs on the blind man. So what's going on here? So if you look at the text, you know, Jesus is just kind of minding his business, going along, healing, teaching, Interacting with the people. And just from out of nowhere, he's passing by this blind man. And for some reason, right, the disciples ask him, Rabbi, look at this blind man. Who sinned? Was it him? Or was it, was it his parents? Well, if you think about it from a logical perspective, none of that actually makes any sense. Because the blind man was blind from birth, right? So, I mean, how could he have sinned if he was in the womb? I mean, it just doesn't work. And again, you know, why would Jesus condemn and, you know, put forth sin on a person that had not even been born due to some, some trespass or some sin that the parent had done? And Jesus picks up on that right away. And for us, we need to understand, you know, God doesn't work that way. God doesn't work that way in the lives of his, of his people. And, you know, Jesus basically goes, you know, those, they're just basically, you know, who did it? Whose fault was it? Was it mom and dad's or was it the kid's fault? And Jesus has none of this, but actually launches into this whole dramatical theme and, and statement that really culminates a whole chapter here where he's talking about, I am the light of the world. He says, don't worry about that stuff. You need to be focusing on me. You need to be thinking about what I came and what I'm doing to the world, and now who I'm going to actually instruct to have you do the same things to the world for me when I'm basically gone. Because Jesus says he is the light of the world, and the light shines. Jesus is the good work, and he says there's good work that we need to do. And for soon the darkness will be coming. For soon the darkness will be coming. So, you know, what does this mean? So I kind of ask myself, well, what is this good work? I mean, is that something I have to do? Or, you know, what is Jesus really instructing his disciples and us to do today? What do you think the good, the good work is? Well, it really, should be pretty apparent that it's really basically what Jesus was teaching his disciples. 
The good work is for us to be disciples and discipleship. You know, part of it is, you know, to being there to care for our neighbors, you know, caring for our families, you know, loving one another, being with others. You know, a few Sundays back, we, we preached on the Beatitudes. Remember those? You know, and it was really kind of interesting because I found a, a preacher that was actually talking, oh, actually I found it on the, on the show. I was watching The Chosen. I've been in The Chosen thing for a while. They've actually been watching the second episode. And they had the chosen where Jesus, you know, was actually going out, and he was had Matthew. They were actually documenting the Sermon on the Mount. And this kind of struck me. I may have already said this. If I did, I apologize. But it was really interesting because one of the ways they portrayed the Beatitudes is that it was a pathway. It was a pathway. So if you want to find Jesus, you need to find people that have these attributes: love, peace, kindness, gentleness. And for us, what Jesus is calling us as far as works is to have those same attributes. Those don't come naturally, do they? No. They're a blessing that God gives to each one of us. And that's what Jesus calls his disciples and us to as works, as for today. That's what he wants us to do. So then what does Jesus do? He spits in the mud. He makes mud. I mean, if I went to Wilson here in town and told him I want some mud and an eye treatment, he'd probably look like look at me like I'm half, like I'm half crazy. That's just, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? That just doesn't make any sense from a human perspective. But God kind of works in mysterious ways, doesn't he? Anybody that would believe that Jesus says, you know, the disciples in half Jerusalem, all the Jews and Israelites, if they would believe that Jesus had to be nailed on the cross and that was his mission and ministry, they'd tell Jesus he was crazy. But God works in different ways in our lives. And I think Jesus did that to show people his power. He was doing that not only for the blind man, but, every, but with everybody else that was around watching all this happen and all this come together. So Jesus spits in the mud and puts it on the blind man's eyes, and he sends him to wash in the pool of Siloma. Now, you've heard of the word shalom, right? Shalom means peace, and it means hell. And that's where that word actually comes from. In the contents, though, it also means sent. Who else was being sent on a journey? Jesus. Jesus was sent to die on the cross for us. So the man was healed. And what does he do? He rejoices. I bet he was rejoicing pretty loudly. That guy was probably dancing around and just having a good old time, just whooping in a hollering. Just like some baptism we had last Sunday, I think. <laughs> so the blind man returns, and his neighbors notice. And this is where it gets kind of funny. They, they, so they're standing around and says, who, who is this blind man? Is he, was, was he really blind? And some say, yeah, I don't know. Some say, no, no. But the blind man is adamant. He says, yeah, that was me. It's me. It truly is me. I was the blind guy. And if you think about it, it's really kind of comical because this guy had been in that, in that relationship in that neighborhood his whole life since birth. So people, quite interestingly, especially then they pose this question to him. So the people asking this question is, how did you come to see? And he's, he said exactly what had happened. The man Jesus made mud, and now I see. And they say, well, where is he? We want to see him. It's like, well, you know, I'm not a secretary. I don't keep his, his schedule. I don't know where he's at. He's out there. It just beats me. I don't know where he's at. So then everybody's kind of getting really serious. They're starting to be thinking about this really seriously. Well, we can't figure this out. We need some help. So where do they go? They go to the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees, they got all the answers, right? And what do the Pharisees see? What do they focus? What's the first thing they focus on? Oh my God, he healed him on the Sabbath. Oh, that is so, so, that just cannot be. It's a fraud. He committed sin. Who is this guy? So the Pharisees themselves, they just cannot see. They can't see the miracle that was right in front of their face. They could not see the real thing that Jesus had come to do for that man 
and do for them. Or maybe it's a situation maybe they don't want to see. Maybe they're scared of the change that's going to have to happen in their lives if they accept the fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. Maybe they're scared. I don't think we can say they're ignorant because they knew the prophecy. So the blind man's sight is getting clearer now. As the blind man goes through and the Pharisees start to question him, you know, what's going on? How did all this happen? How do you know? Who do you think this Jesus is? Now the blind man gets clear. He says, oh, he's a prophet. He's a prophet. See how the Spirit's starting to work in this guy. So the blind man and his parents, you know, they all kind of get together. So the parents come and they're there. And the parents, you know, they actually said, you know, is this your son? And they go, yeah, this is our son. You know, was he blind at birth? Well, they need some more concrete evidence. Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to get the they're trying to get the blind man not to give credit to Jesus for that miracle. Because they're afraid. And the parents answer truthfully, yeah, he's our son. He was blind at birth. And then they ask again, well, how the Pharisees, how can this be? And it's like, okay, these guys are really thick. Well, they parents say, we ask him. He's the one that was healed. Parents are blinded by fear. They didn't want to answer the question themselves because they were fearful that they were going to be betrayed and actually removed and kept from being in the temple, which was a big deal for people in those days, especially the Jews. I mean, that was that was tremendous for them. So then the blind man sees the Pharisees again, and you know they rail on him again. I mean, like the third time. And then, you know, the blind man asks, you know, why, why do you keep asking me these same questions? I have already told you. And then, I don't know, the spirit must have been working to, to really tick these guys off. Because this blind man basically comes back and says, why do you ask again? Do you want to be one of his disciples too? I mean, that was like probably the last nail in the coffin. And these guys basically go again and, and really hammer this guy about, you know, about their whole Moses. You know, we follow Moses. You know, we heard the Lord speak through Moses, but we don't know who this man is. We are disciples of Moses. So the blind man teaches the Pharisees a little, and they don't like that. The blind man really had finally grasped the concept of what had happened in his life. And that's just not by, you know, by circumstance. That was all designed by the way the Spirit was working into him. And so finally the Pharisees get a lesson on logic and theology. They get, they get upset, and what do they do with the blind man? They boot him up. says, hit the real jack. The blind man said he is from God. The logic is sound, but notice how the blind man sees even more clearly now. Jesus is more than just a prophet, isn't he? Jesus finally seeks out the blind man. Because Jesus' ministry and mission was not done for that particular person. You notice how he singles him out and finds him. And Jesus asks him the questions. And Jesus says, I am he, I am the one. And the blind man worships him. Now, a lack of worship like that, like the blind man did, was only reserved as an act of for God himself. So all this accumulation of this whole situation that go on, is going on here now is just one more situation where Jesus was actually pitting himself against the established rule and authority of Jerusalem. And he was doing it for two reasons. One, because the truth needed to be known about him. But second, he was preparing for his up and coming death on the cross. So here's the question for you today. <coughs> we get blinded and lose focus of what God is doing for us. We do. I do. You know, 
we don't have Jesus coming up and spitting in the dirt and rubbing mud in our eyes. But there's a whole different level idea of what Jesus does for us each and every day. How he cares for us and nurtures us. How he leads us in our daily walk. And he cares for us. Even in the bad days, God can make everything good for us again. But we need to recognize and see that. And what I mean there is sometimes I can get in this situation in my life where things aren't going really well. And it may not be big things, but just a combination of a lot of little things. And I start to focus on that. And sometimes I can get just a little bit, a little bit moody. Maybe that's a good word, moody. Ask my wife. And you know, all of this is just when you start to lose focus and you're focusing on other things in your life that just start dragging you down. And that's how Satan works in our lives. But, you know, praise God that I have friends and family, all of you, my wife, others, to say, you know what? Why are you acting this way? Look at the blessings God has given you. You know, you don't have time for this. There's plenty of work that you need to be doing. Praise God and snap out of it and let him lead and guide your life. Don't focus on the bad. Focus on the good. So what's the takeaway? What's the takeaway from this lesson? <clears throat> so I've got three here. This is what I think we should take away. There's more, for sure. But here's three. God works outside of our realm of human understanding. Obviously. Even today, God is out there working. Sometimes we just don't see it and recognize it. Sometimes we do and we just say, this has got to be a miracle. Because this is happening in my life, and I have no clue why. I've seen that happen before in my own life. God is active, and sometimes you just can't see it. But he's always active. He's always there for us, working in our lives, taking care of us, leading us, and guiding us. So don't question. Question again can be like we talked about a Sunday ago to testing. Don't test the Lord. Don't question. Just accept it and follow it. Kind of like call it like ride the wave, you know, see where it's going to take you. But have faith that the Lord's going to carry you through all this stuff. Have the faith. And fourth, this is another one. This is we should praise God and give him thanks for all the miracle he does in our lives each and every day. Because he does give and provide for us more than we truly deserve, doesn't he? So this is the progression of faith that happened in the blind man. And it happens into us too. Our faith walk is, is a journey, isn't it? So don't continue in, in blindness, but continue in the light of the Lord, knowing that he's guiding us with his light through this darkened world. And I pray that you would concentrate and think about and examine where God has really blessed each one of you. All this I pray in Jesus. Amen. So I'd like to uh, continue now as uh, we recite these rites, as we uh, confess our faith in the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his fathers before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten on age, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. And he was crucified for us and for us in conscious father. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come.
Friends in Christ, I urge you all to lift up your hearts to God and pray with me as Christ, our Lord, has taught us and freely promises to hear us. God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word. And the fervent love shown forth in our lives, graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound by the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son by faith, that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily, <clears throat> excuse me, and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands today we come in and we pray. Pray for healing for Roy, Jim, Jeannie, Stetson, Dave, Tom, Greg. Katie, Miranda, Paisley, Cindy, Rindy, Delia, Vallejo, Vicki, Klaus, Ray, Sandy, and Judy, and all who are in need, praying for them at all times that you would grant them peace and healing. Thy will be done, Lord, in your mercy. We also pray that you would be with the Powell family. As they, as they mourn the loss of a loved one, help give them peace and the promise of the resurrection. Be with them and strengthen their faith and put amongst them in their midst people that will love and care for them during this time. Lord, in your mercy, grant us our daily bread, preserve us from all greed and selfish cares, and help us to trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you. <clears throat> and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. And lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue the flesh, to turn from the world, and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. And lastly, let me, Father, deliver us from evil of both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Reach us, the Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with the offering. <coughs>
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, Lord our God. You call us by you call us to be your people who acknowledge our sin and who find our hope of salvation in you alone. Direct our lives in ways of faithfulness, discovering what is good and right and true and rejoicing in your undeserved love for us. Grant that we may receive the body and blood of our Lord here given as the guarantee of our salvation and as a foretaste of the feast to come in your eternal kingdom. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and praise, together with the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen.
receive the Lord's blessing. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. I'd ask you to please be seated as we sing the closing hymn. service, so no Bible study. Okay, this gets a day off. No Bible study next Sunday. Then Mike has something else to share. With so, I know I sometimes can embarrass my own children. <laughs> so, uh, let's continue this. Is Today's a very special day. Not just a Sunday. Not just a day we get to meet. But it is Miss Georgia's seventh birthday. But, but, the Burkhart family gets to celebrate even more because Walker, now, get ready for this, I cannot believe this, has turned 13 a couple days ago. So we want to tell both of you, happy birthday. Now let's celebrate. 